thanks to Paul Brown, who must be somewhere in here, and to Daniel uh, for deciding not to make me responsible to do what I'm supposed to do now, uh, talk to, uh, as a foreigner, not even really capable of speaking the language, so excuse. Uh, maybe you understand parts of it, the more trivial parts. Thank you, Nick and CAS, Computer Society, uh, for bringing me here. It was interesting last night in the hotel when I checked in. They had sent me an email several days before. Uh, it's time now for you to check in. Uh, because if you do this online, they said, it'll save time. I, of course, knew that this will not save my time. It will save time of the management and they'll get rid of some people who they would. So I replied. There was a reply button uh, and sent an email to them. Uh, sorry, I will not do this online because I prefer meeting you at your desk. However, that email was automatically uh, returned uh, by <laughs> saying, not because of contents, the system was not clever enough to find out what, it just replied uh, or sent it back by saying, this is not supposed to be answered, the message I had <laughs> received before. Okay, so I took the chance to check in at midnight last night, and there was a person who asked me, you have not checked in? No, I have not checked in. I wanted to talk to you. Well, wait a minute. Come over here, he says, and there's a huge machine where you check in online, no? <laughs> which was impossible for me to do and almost for him. He helped me a lot. No? So it was sure that had I tried to do this at home, it would have cost me 15 or maybe even more minutes. Um, he at one point in time said, oh, don't do the uh, passport numbers and so forth. But the system refused checking me in. So he tried my first name, didn't work, until I decided, you know what, that system wants to get my passport number. <laughs> it worked. Um, okay, why do I tell you this stupid story? I do it uh, in preparation, in that anticipation of my last remark, which Paul and Daniel, I don't really know what I will be saying then, depends on how the next half hour uh, will pass by. They, the two, believe they put into the show on one of these um, written um, displays that they, and I have known Paul for long enough to, to know or at least to think he believes this, that one day will come when computers will do something called art without human intervention. Again, I do not know what I will say in the end, um, but I do not believe this. And I told you the story uh, about the hotel because it's not as touchy as art. Uh, we would believe, okay, this can be done, checking into a hotel can be done uh, without human intervention. Last night, I would, have, I would not have been able to check in without help of that person. So thank you for allowing me to do this. Brown and Sun, and now I try to get these slides going. Brown and Sun is one part of the title of this exhibition. The other, the other part of the title is Art That Makes Itself. Now, these two parts of the title, in my thinking, are totally opposite to each other. Brown and Sun, to me, sounds, this is coming from the time of, say, Ruskin, uh, or at least the art and crafts movement, 
from times when in Brown and Son you trusted. You knew they are in the neighborhood. You knew what they are doing, what they stand for. You know, they were trustworthy people. Art that makes itself? Can that be art? Anything that makes itself, can that be art? When something makes itself, makes, they use the word make. They don't say produce. They use make. And isn't making essential to the human being? Isn't making what we do when we do something? Much of our time, unfortunately, we are not allowed to buy systems to make something, but just to do something, to carry out, to click, and so forth. That's not making. Isn't making a very innocent word, a low level in terms of semantics word, I would say. But perhaps this is time when we should be come becoming aware of the richness of making. Because they perhaps do not allow ourselves to do much making anymore. So you see here, this is how I, what I thought when I read the title Brown and Son and was thinking about you are supposed to say something to these people who are friendly enough to come here this Saturday afternoon, even with sun outside, wonderful, uh, and we're sitting in here. I was thinking of uh, this caricature, which in a German context many people would know. I guess you, you, you haven't seen this. You haven't. Okay, this was a famous, famous, famous pair. No? And you see how friendly the father is. What are they doing? They are hanging in the air. Somehow you don't see, no, but we know they are swinging back and forth, most likely on a long rope to such. No, and the son is totally trusting his father. He closes his eyes. He's all with himself, with his father. They know this is fantastic. Um, here you have one of these typical, they were pictures without words. All the artist did was one, two, three, usually six at times, uh, four uh, scenes. And look at this. This is making. It's a funny kind of making. Um, the son throws a stone into the water, the river Thames. Um, the, the father does it also, a little more forcefully, maybe. Uh, the son enjoys this. They do it for a while, we can assume, and then they run out of little stones, pebbles. The last one, the sun finds, they go home. Uh, you see, you hardly can see it here in this reproduction, the sun setting at the horizon. And during the night, the father is working, as we see. Hmm? Little indications only. Next day, they return. The son has no idea who made this. Why is there this huge pile of pebbles? And and the father is rather proud. Uh, now, this is a trivial little story, and it's old, old-fashioned, and it has nothing to do with computers. But maybe some of us, and I'm sure the two artists who present their works here, keep the spirit of this little scene, I believe, in whichever <coughs> metaphorical sense. I haven't even given you the title of this presentation. It'll come in a minute. I want to go through a little exercise here. We see black and yellow, more or less, triangles. We see this, and most likely some of you already start combining. We see these shapes, all very mathematical, geometrical, I should say. All right. 
Here they are together again, these four. Uh huh. The black as the background against these four colors looks totally different from white as the background. Although the four color extractions uh, are more or less the same. One and two and three and four. And in a little better where you don't see the white in between, that's the work under which this exhibition was announced for quite a time. And, and you see it in the exhibition and you see even, an in, uh, not interactive, but a dynamic and animated version of it in the on the upper floor so that's one word one work by paul brown a piece of systemics systems whichever way you want to put combinatorial art uh, you could think of now how many are there of this kind and what you would be doing is you would probably use the small little triangles as you see uh, a yellowish or down here in the uh, uh, lower right corner uh, in the upper left also uh, no these are two already um, there's no no that's right that's the smallest triangle and as you can easily combine that triangle is one half of a square and you go on and easy to discover that this is altogether an 8 by 8 square, no? and the 8 by 8, 64 uh, squares make up the grid upon which this is constructed. And by dividing the square into two triangles, which you can do in two ways, you get a richer set of elements out of which this combinatorial piece is done. If we were a seminar, we would now enter into this, and it would be a tremendous world that opens, but pure combinatorics to, to do all the possible images of this kind. There are, one first estimate would be 128 over 48 out of whatever reasons, and that's a tremendous number. But that's only an estimate. It would be four times uh, this number, millions. All right. However, from some point of view of some aesthetics, this is boring. Paul, you are old enough to accept this. Uh, this is boring. It's not boring. Because I just wanted to put it into a context that is amazing and not known to the majority of people in the world. And this is just one example of that huge world that Paul made appear here in this individual piece. And when you, when you think back a few times no, um, here, where we have three of the colors, you would easily discover that blue and the missing green are equally often represented here. So are yellow and red. There is so many of the red triangles, 16, and the same number in um, red and yellow, and the other ones are 48. And then there is a lot of um, symmetry going on here. Now, taking these two, uh, look at. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. What am I doing here? Um, see, this yellow, this is totally symmetric. Nothing free. 
What would you use a, need a computer for? Not at all. The computer is not needed here. Not at all. Um, you, you could switch the middle two triangles so that they uh, point out to the outside. Okay, that's already the next version. No? And everything would change. Aha, so we see here indicated to us the system, and in the other parts also, we see the system that is working behind, and here, he, Paul, has made something. If I, who has no idea how to make anything, uh, would write my computer program, it would immediately start randomizing everything. And for years, those images that would come out of the computer would be boring like hell before this other boring piece by Paul uh, appears. Hello, sir. Thank you. And I go on to... This remark, which is the uh, title of my little presentation here. Um, some remarks, only scattered remarks in half an hour. I don't try to do anything systematic, uh, because I'm talking about systems art. But I'll also be talking about generative art. And systems art is a kind of generative art, yes. But maybe systems art can be characterized as a low level of generative art. Low not in any qualitative sense, but low in the sense of it's more or less combinatorics that is happening there. And when we add randomness, we get into somehow, in some funny way that I at least do not understand very well, into some other area of generative art where the computer makes more sense uh, to be used. Um, yeah, so that's... Oh, you may, can you see the lowest uh, line? But I cannot change it now anyway. Uh, we would have to move these tables. That would be a, an act of making something, but we leave them. Uh, it's too dangerous now. So if you have, this is trivial, a set of elements, Max Benze, who got mentioned by Nick Lambert before, um, we used to call that, that set of elements a repertoire. And I should say, Nick, uh, this is sensational. Um, not only did you use his name, Max Benze, in this introduction, we also see it in the exhibition uh, showing up. Um, uh, referred to uh, several times. In Germany, nobody would refer to Max Benzer. So Britain is leading in recognizing a certain kind of aesthetics. I, I now know and I'll do something. I currently give a, a seminar on, on trends in generative art. Uh, next week, I'll tell them, go to Britain. <laughs> they will come and take your jobs. <laughs> but quickly before you leave the two letter thing uh, a set of elements and a set of rules that's all you need in order to do something in this world of generative art well that's not really everything because you then have to apply the rules to the elements. But unless you explicitly specify the elements you're going to work with and the rules you're going to apply, and the rules are of course more difficult and more sensitive to what is will be able to be done afterwards, uh, unless you do this, nothing generative will happen. So Jackson Pollock is out of the game. Because he throws paint against a uh, canvas, right? And many others uh, do. All emotions are gone. I should take this back. I make the statement first. Uh, this is not an emotional kind of art. However, it is, of course, arousing emotions. 
in the maker, in the programmer, in perhaps, hopefully, the audience, clearly. However, in the making itself, there's no emotion. That's the difference, I believe, simple um, as this. Uh, so, I want to stick to, yeah. We see here one simple, 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 systematic, not really, random drawing that was shown at the first exhibition. Again, Nick Lambert mentioned it in February 1965, uh, when in, in Benz's little gallery, Georg Nees had the first exhibition of what then was indeed called computer art. I should say one word, it was not really called computer art. And it's not known what the title, uh, even Georg Nees, when I asked him, could not tell me what was the title of that exhibition. One doesn't really know. I have here the first publication uh, on computer art. No? That's it. It's called Red Road uh, number 19. No? Uh, and this little brochure, it contains nothing, almost nothing. Uh, contains a few drawings. You cannot see them, but you maybe you see that. And a little text that starts here and it's just two and a half pages long. Uh, that's, I would claim, the manifesto of computer art. However, it comes under the title Projects of Generative Aesthetics. The term generative, I will return to this towards the end, um, the term generative gets coined in some way, not really coined, used here. Generative Aesthetics. This text Projects of Generative Aesthetics is one of the few only that were translated from the German into English. Uh, in fact, you find it in the um, Studio International special issue for Cybernetic Serendipity exhibition in 68 at the ICA uh, here, Institute of Contemporary Art. Um, all right, uh, so I show this only because there's some other type of systematics in here. And it's, of course, a grid. The, the grid, do, do you know the book? Read it, uh, get it, uh, by, by Hannah Higgins. The grid, the, the grid book it's called. The title of that book is The Grid Book. Hannah Higgins, the daughter you know, of Nick Dick Higgins. Um, so, randomness in a grid. Now, he has a, a simple, simple, simple little figure, the schema for a figure, the pattern, and that he repeats, he makes his computer uh, repeat in this little panel. That's a generative principle from the first moment on, and we still are stuck with it, even if the forms, it appears, are much more elaborate. I wanted to mention this anecdote when Georg Nies had that first exhibition in Stuttgart. He was working for the Siemens company, one of the big players you know, in the world, making money. Um, and they said, okay, yeah, do this. However, in connection with our name, Siemens, the word art is not going to be used. They were afraid of not being taken seriously anymore. If what one of their <laughs> employees is doing is considered by some stupid people to be art, or at least close to art. And you know what is even in more interesting is that at roughly the same time, two months apart, same time, in 1965, Michael Knoll in New York, in Murray Hills, Bell Laboratories, um, experiences the same. In a slightly different way, the American way, they also, Bell Labs say, you know what, no, you, because he has an exhibition in April 65 uh, in the famous Howard Weiss Gallery, New York, and they tell him no mentioning of art in our context, um, in, in, in that context of that exhibition. He, however, went a different way. He then uh, put copyright marks 
uh, on all of his uh, drawings, uh, thereby making them his own stuff, no longer Bell's. Uh, so in case anybody was, because at Howard Wise, this gallery, it's hard not to mention the word art. <laughs> That's, that would be ridiculous. Psst, no? Somebody, you, what you just said, you didn't say. Um, he would have, so he, therefore, he hates the idea that he copyrighted his drawings because now they are from 65 by copyright. However, he wants them to be from 63. Uh, historically, it doesn't matter at all. No. Um, nice little stories, if you like. Um, the idea, this quote, is one of, I hope I don't read you wrongly here, Paul, uh, of Paul Brown's favorites. And it must be a favorite of almost everybody in computer art, in generative art, the idea becomes the machine that makes the art. This is one of the sentences on conceptual art that Sol Levit published in 67. I did not write the following letter to him. I did not write the following letter to him. Dear Sol Levit, admired artist, I love your sentences on conceptual art. I in particular like that you said this, the idea that becomes the machine that makes the art. However, I'm sorry to tell you that this is already fact. Two years before you wrote it, I did it. Um, I did not write this letter. Uh, I'm glad that I did not write this letter because uh, this way, so Levit will always have felt good. No? Otherwise, he m might have been disappointed uh, that some some people dared to do what he then later wrote, uh, because he did not turn his ideas into machines. And conce conceptual art is, of course, the great frame for any kind of computer art. Computer art is conceptual art turned into a machine. That's it. No? Um, because the program is always the manifestation of a concept. And to use a computer makes sense in order to produce something called art. Makes sense only if your intention is to have many, to have series uh, produced. Um, so what you do there is you don't make the art, you think it. And I on purpose say, don't, I do not say think of art, but you think art. In this little difference of the word appearing or not appearing of thinking art or thinking of art, you have the difference between the generative artist who thinks art and let's say the art critic, the art historian who think of art because they are not always have all the originals around them, and so on. Um, so thinking art is in some way impossible. What a nonsense. Art must be perceivable, must it not? I believe in it. I totally believe in it. As a human being with a body, I want to see it. I want to hear it. I want to feel it, smell it, taste it. Right? Otherwise, if it's not essentially perceivable, I do not consider it art. However, the time came in the mid-60s when people were thinking art. That's the revolution. That's why this is uh, has caught on uh, so uh, tremendously. And when you think art, you immediately get into this problem, that you think infinities and not individual pieces. The making is human in some way because you make this thing, this one particular example, if you like. But if you then turn yourself into this funny being that is dealing with computers that are somehow, somehow, in some way, our, now I say a dangerous word, our brethren, I don't mean it. No, I only use that as a metaphor. They are our companions 
already this is dangerous a word. Nevertheless, they are the computers, semiotic machines, machines dealing with sign processes. We are humans, semiotic animals. Those animals, we are animals, first of all, but we are those animals who deal with, who invent all the time, without ever stopping, incessantly. We are dealing with sign processes, with semioses. And in the semiotic capacities, those funny machines, computers, and we meet. I think this, the fact that we both, in our different ways, definitely very, very different ways, deal with sign processes, in this fact, we find the ground for people, Maggie Bowden will be speaking afterwards, uh, do something they call artificial intelligence. In the semiotic domain, the computer, however, is always doing it only in computational ways. There's a definite limit, and that's everything must be computable. We are beyond the computability limit. We are now clearly the, a, a jump ahead you know, from the combinatorical generative approach by Paul Brown to Daniel's flowers, you know, of which you see many outside and upstairs. Uh, you even see them growing. And you are the homeland of Darcy Thompson, you know, whose famous book on growth and form is about a hundred years old. You wouldn't believe it. Last week I asked my students in Bremen, Germany, have you heard of, Dar this is master students in digital media, um, have you heard of Darcy Thompson? No. 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 Should I? Yes, you should, because you study digital media. You have to do with form. No, never heard of. Um, okay, um, most likely, I hope, at least these two artists, Daniel and Paul, they are not just aware of Darcy Thompson. They, they use, they have read him, his, his book. They have turned, they, they make what he talks about. Now, Darcy Thompson, of course, is, was a biologist. His growth and form is life. Theirs is not life. They do it in a semiotic domain. Therefore, they are inclined to believe, oh, maybe, maybe this becomes life. We are so different from computers because we know we are going to die. And no computer will ever have the faintest inkling of what that means. And all our intelligence, all our great makings are in the horizon of our dying existence. This difference, I firmly believe, uh, cannot be taken away from us. Even though you now have kind of criminals, they call themselves scientists, you know, who in, in German newspapers, I guess that's the same here, maybe you are more enlightened. Um, they talk about, oh, will we be living uh, eternally? Fantastic. Fantastic. They are doing some technology uh, that will implant more and more stuff into us so that we become, I don't know, some pile of crap that is hanging on some machines and, and doing I don't know what. What a stupid idea. The human being is born and is dying. And that's in some way fantastic. I hate it. Of course I hate it. I don't want to die. <laughs> I don't want to die. But I will. I will. I will. 
So I better get myself into sync with myself. And I do this by making something. Um, I sent an email to Daniel um, asking him, now, what do you do in order to have these forms appear? Uh, and he, w which are not just fantastic, fantastic. If you are a person who makes a program, and I purposefully said make here, um, who makes a program that then produces such forms. And here is another one. Uh, then... What you are doing is, you must think of the growth of the structure that we will then not see, the structure as such. And you secondly think of the appearance of shapes. And he, when I somehow asked him, what are you doing? In, sen in the sense of making a program, says, oh, the stems, this is not quite literally, but almost, the stems, um, I let my program make as an iterative branching, he says, looking occasionally for low density areas. All right. And he says the pedals, textures as recursive tiling with rotational symmetry. I put these words here because they are in a little different arrangement. Uh, his words in an email and they contain technical terms. For instance, the beautiful recursive tiling. The computer is the machine of recursion. Mathematics is the discipline of recursion. The theory of recursion, whatever that is, is in mathematics. But then the practice of recursion is computer science. And computer science explores recursive processes recursive events, recursive appearances. And recursion, i.e. referring to yourself. In recursion, you define something by already knowing it. I made that point with the semiotics because the modern found founder of semiotics, Charles Sanders Peirce, define the sign, without telling us, as a recursive structure. Peirce's definition of the sign is in itself recursive. Therefore, he, he died in 1914, so at a point of time when modernity comes to one of its most horrible ends, 1914, he was the first postmodern thinker, Charles Peirce. Namely, thinking in terms long before it happened, in terms of recursion, of processes that rely on each other in order to be perhaps manageable, to be carried out. Um, our times is marked by recursion, and therefore, um, this last slide had uh, in, implanted into it by talking about structure, hidden, and appearance, visible, perceivable, sensually perceivable, uh, something I uh, like to call nowadays the subface and the surface. Everything that becomes victim of being computerized exists in these two forms, in this double form, a perceivable sub surface for us, <laughs> a perceivable, the per perceivable, that's, that is good for us in our finite existence, but at the same time in a machinic form, not only in the philosophical sense of thinking about it, a hidden Subface. And the subface on the machine has become computable. In there, in the subface, hidden somewhere, 
we have the secret of why it is possible to make computers do something that often we are surprised by, aren't we? I am. I, I guess Paul and others amongst you, uh, I see Sue Golliver and others, uh, they will often, I hope, be, have been surprised by what their machines, their programs did when they made the computer do something. So this surprise comes from the computer being capable, indeed being capable of doing something that when it appears at the surface, perceivable for us, we think, oh, that's fantastic. That's beautiful. That's exciting. That's horrible. I hate it. You know, arousing our emotions down there at the surface that we, those who program, is our field. You know, that, that's where we are making something. Up there at the surface, we are not making. But down in there, we do. We are makers. And there, we must be rational. So this postmodern identity is one where the accusation, oh, you are so rational, or you are so terribly emotional, does not make any sense anymore. We are both at the same time. Isn't that fantastic? I believe it is. Is it not at the same time horrible? When you think, I come from Germany, a dangerous country, um, we just now, I do not know how it was celebrated here in Germany. It was the, the uh, television programs were full of for the last two months you know, of event after event, 70 years after 1945. And all of these events were just terrible. The pictures you could see, of course, were Terrible, terrible. And the Germans are responsible for this feast amongst the Nazis, under the Nazis, of emotion. Hitler was the great mover. Everybody wanted to be where he was, even if it was 500 meters away. Oh, I saw him from far apart. Great emotions. Max Benzer started his totally rational aesthetics as a reaction against Nazi Germany. No emotions, he said, allowed in art. Because the aesthetics is easy you know, to be turned into something criminal. We now, I do believe, it's only a belief, I cannot prove this, we now have the chance, you know, by dealing with computers in an enlightened way, in an enlightened way, to be to be present in, in, on both these levels of the human existence, the very rational and the very emotional as one and the same. I should come to the end. Uh, this is another uh, piece. Um, can I think one can see it uh, by uh, Daniel? Um, you probably cannot. I must lie down on the floor. I put down here again some technical words. No, uh, Lady Gaga, of course, emotion, emotion, emotion. No, <laughs> Whew, explosions of emotion, nothing but. Um, so he scans something, whatever that means. You all know it. Interactive particle system. He says, and then OpenGL, OpenGL, uh -huh. uh, Opt-C, Objective-C, programming languages, uh, some funny talking about something, um, particle systems, whatever it is, you see them here. And they are a fantastic way of describing certain processes that can be done only now when computers have become extremely powerful extremely powerful, unimaginably powerful. Something that the human mind made up and has always known, always known, always known, but now there is a machine onto which you can, or for which you can describe particle systems, and that machine is then independently of each other calculating what each of these 
maybe hundreds, certainly thousands of little particles uh, make up these images. Um, and here he has, uh, Daniel, another famous mathematical knowledge, fractals, that are behind at the surface, this surface here. Whatever fractals are, they are, of course, as a result of the human mind, old, 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 old. Um, Felix Hausdorff, a German mathematician, in the early 20th century, came up with the notion of fractal uh, geometry, fractal dimension, I should have said. Felix Hausdorff was also the mathematician who invented that term that I used before, the human as the semiotic uh, animal. Uh, I'll, I'll get to uh, the end. Um, I had announced that generative aesthetics, Max Benz's term, at the occasion of Georg Nese's first exhibition, um, uh, had a precursor. And that's, of course, Noam Chomsky, who used generative grammar about roughly 10 years before. Generative grammar, I don't have time to get into now, but it's interesting from the following point of view. Chomsky, a linguist, not only a radical intellectual, as who we know him now, um, as a linguist, he wanted in the 50s, that's when he is a young researcher at MIT, um, he wanted to understand, as so many others, language, a natural phenomenon that we are all aware of that we use day by day, minute by minute. Um, but he turned around his attempt to understand natural language from all the other approaches in linguistics. In which way? In the way that he says, oh, I'm not going to analyze, I'm going to synthesize. I'll generate sentences according to a grammar that those sentences, because they are made, are correct and belong to the language. Out of this attempt, um, something in computer science emerged that is extremely important for all programming languages ever since. And in fact, Chomsky, as a linguist, failed miserably. He did not explain language. His transformational grammar um, is way too hard. One cannot understand it. But that's the fate whenever we, human beings, try to explain, understand something that is natural, if we take human language as natural. Namely, when we try to do this, we don't understand the natural phenomenon, we create the basis for something artificial, for programming languages. They are artificial products. The human being cannot understand the world. We can make artificial worlds. That's what is happening in computer art. And I skip this now. <laughs> um, but this is the major message. The revolution of think art, the revolution of the recursive approach to something in the world, destroys the idea of masterpieces. The very kind of thinking, think art, as then you think in infinities, turns into ridic ridicule, is that a word, um, um, the idea of a masterpiece. Everything is nice that is coming out of there. Um, Daniel will have a hard time, not because um, you should make sure that only a few of your flowers uh, are in the world. No? Otherwise people will, oh yeah, uh, Daniel Brown. Yeah, flowers. Okay, Daniel Brown. Nobody has ever seen those flowers. They are fantastic. They are artificial. They are artificial flowers that look like natural flowers. Programming languages are artificial languages that in some way sound like natural language. Um, and uh, to bring this to a short little uh, 
uh, this slide and one uh, last one, uh, giving just a few dates here. 1963, early 1960s is when people started, Michael Knorr, Georg Nees, uh, one or two others, uh, to th even think of using computers, that is, machines made for computation, now to draw. 1963 is the year, I do remember this well out of some biographical reasons, is the year when some people in the world, not knowing of each other, forced the machine into doing something that, besides computing, it did not want to do, namely to draw. And what is so fantastic is calculating, counting, and drawing are the two basic capabilities of human beings. Calculating and, cal and, and counting is the digital. Drawing is the analog, the discrete, the continuous. Already in the cave, at the beginning of culture, you have those. You have marks on the walls of the caves, you know, where they have clearly counted, and you have drawings. So the digital and the analog are not different. They belong together. It doesn't make any sense to talk of, oh, it's so digital now. <laughs> because it is not. No? Uh, we, uh, and to, to sum this up, all what I've tried to say here uh, uh, belongs to the, the algorithmic revolution that has been going on for quite a while and is still continuing. And it's a nice revolution because there's little bloodshedding. People lose their jobs, however. Be aware of. Uh, and and these states, our states, must, they hate it, give a minimum salary. Right? Otherwise, people would work but starve to death. Um, so that's all part of the, of the algorithmic revolution. I prefer, uh, Paul, Daniel, others, to say algorithmic revolution and not digital revolution. This is only a word. It doesn't make a great difference. A little difference it makes, it may make. The algorithm is the important part. Because in the algorithm, we have the attempt to put into machinic forms what we do. An algorithmic description is the description of an activity. The digital describes only the currently leading, guiding, uh, dominating form in which this appears. That's definitely important, but it's not the essence. The essence is the algorithmic. And you know what? Um, Edward Snowden is the one who made the world aware of there is something, and these mathematicians and computer science have been dealing with that for decades now, there is something in the world that they call algorithm. The word algorithm came into usual daily press products through Edward Snowden. What the hell is this now? The algorithm. We should be we should be part of you know, this enlightening movement that says we the computer scientists, the mathematicians, we have some means that make it possible to describe certain activities of the human being in so close and exact forms that machines can carry those can carry out those activities. And the second lesson we must learn is, however, be careful. Or maybe you do not want to do this. The, the domain we are talking about, art, is so innocent. It's so nice, you know, because we like to look at these images. But our companion, Nick has mentioned that I, in 71, wrote this little note, there should be no computer art. Uh, that was behind it. You know, the uneasy feelings of doing something that is nice and I like. However, I should also hate. Thanks a lot.